Okay, so before we get started, I just want to get this out of the way. This video has been a long time coming. As a matter of fact, I completed it all the way back in January. Unfortunately, it got blocked several times and I wasn't able to get it out. And my second account was almost obliterated because of it. However, I still very much want to get this out because I worked so, so hard on it. So first, I'm going to throw this out here. This is a major, major eye strain warning. Most of this video's footage is completely blurred to the point where you cannot tell what's going on. So try not to look at it for too long. This video is meant to be listened to so as to not violate copyright. Second, the references in this video are hilariously out of date, but that's neither here nor there. Third, this series will likely not continue unless you would like a series with just screenshots instead of actual footage. This is really, really important. You need to let me know in the comments and please be as vocal as possible because this was originally supposed to be a 15 part plus series and honestly done by now. <laughs> Fourth, special thanks to everyone who encouraged me to post this and I am so sorry it took so long. Special thanks to Moon and my supportive buddies over on TikTok for their help. Now, without further ado, we proceed with the video. One of the best things about Netflix is that it's really been keeping us sane over the whole crisis that was 2020 and possibly 2021. You know, we're not speaking anything into existence at the moment. However, I've been picking up different shows, even though I'm not necessarily a TV show person per se. As a matter of fact, I barely watch live action shows these days, uh, especially after what happened with Game of Thrones. We don't talk about that. Anyways, I've always been kind of a lover of foreign dramas, or at least they're foreign to me because I'm from the United States. So I've watched Korean dramas, Taiwanese dramas, and Chinese dramas, and I happened to cross The Untamed, and I sort of watched it on a whim. I didn't like it the first two times I watched the first couple of episodes, but that's because I completely misunderstood the plot. When I finally buckled down and gave it a chance, I fell in love with it. It's great. I would say, out of all of the Chinese dramas I've watched uh, over the last five years, I would say that The Untamed is probably in my top five, maybe even in my top three. It's a breath of fresh air, honestly, especially with everything that's been going on. You know, everybody needs a little escapism now and then. And you know, honestly, I think this is one of the few shows where I genuinely feel better for the experience. Like, I feel like it opened up my brain. <laughs> and it might just be because of the lack of stimuli we have going on, but you know, quarantine isn't gonna last forever. <laughs> At least that's what I tell myself. <laughs> So, naturally, I want to rip the show apart and analyze it bit by bit because, you know, what else are the hyperfixations for, am I right? So, The Untamed is a 2019 Chinese drama based off the novel Grand Master of Demonic Cultivation by Mo Jiang Tongzhi and is one of three adaptations of the book. Before we get started, there are a few things I should add. This is a series for adults and I will be referring to several different other pieces of media from different countries throughout these videos. So, I will warn accordingly for spoilers, and so, just a heads up, there are spoilers for Persona 5 in this video. Also, this show is heavily censored. Despite this, the themes can get rather dark, with graphic, though bloodless, depictions of death, war crimes, sexual assault, and copious amounts of stank face. Speaking of the censorship, the two male leads in this show are in a romantic relationship in the books. However, it's drastically pared down and only hinted at in the show. The directors, editors, and actors found ways to honor the original work with small gestures, so I will be referring to Wei Wuxian and Long Wanji as a romantic couple. This censorship did eventually lead to some rogue fans of the lead actor Xiao Zhan to report fanfiction writers they deemed morally reprehensible to the government. Eventually, the Chinese government did end up banning Archive of Our Own and I believe fanfiction.net as a result, resulting in Xiao Zhan's career taking a little bit of a nosedive right into the debate over ethics of limiting free speech in China. That is a gross oversimplification of everything that happens, and I'm not going to harp on it for long. But I'll leave a link below to the NPR recording and transcript about the whole situation, because they describe it in much better terms and without the Western lens on everything. Despite this, both lead actors and the director of the show have won several accolades, including Best Actor and Best Director by audience and committee vote. So the show and the actors are still clearly well-loved, despite the controversy. While the book, in my opinion, is the 
far superior work and does a much better job of fleshing out the moral challenges of war, survival, and if good and evil truly exist, I don't necessarily have the time to read it. Because if you've ever watched a Dominic Noble video, and if you haven't, I really suggest watching any of his videos, they're amazing. For his book to adaptation comparisons, he reads the book upwards of six times, and while I do like this book, I don't necessarily have the time for that because I still have a full-time job. So unless I feel absolutely compelled to, I won't be doing a complete book to adaptation comparison. The plot is fairly intricate, so this series will be in several parts, and those parts will be divided into bite-sized sections with analysis throughout. And after that, I'm going to be putting an emphasis on relationships, and because if y'all know me, or if you've seen any of my previous videos from my other channel, you know that I love world building and relationships. Of course, spoilers everywhere for every episode. If you just happen to stumble across this video uh, while wondering if you want to watch this show, I actually strongly encourage you to watch the show before you watch this. Uh, content warnings once again, everything you could think of, and just keep in mind about the censorship in this show. It does talk about some heavy topics, and we're gonna go into great detail, and there is a lot of coughing up of cherry syrup blood. Like, a lot. If you're gonna watch Chinese dramas, just get used to it. And so without further ado, my name is Dr. Cannon, and welcome to your consultation. The Untamed is the story of how Wei Wuxian became the Yiling Patriarch, an infamous necromancer who died shamed and exiled from the cultivation world. Sixteen years later, he finds himself resurrected and reunited with his closest friend, Long Wenji. Together, they discover the conspiracy against him that led to his death and avenge an old friend in the process. Starring, but not limited to, Luo Mianmian Qingyang, Wen Qing, Wen Ying, Zhen Ziquan, Lan Zichen, Nie Mingzhui, Jin Guang, Yao, Nye Huaisang, Zhang Yanli, Zhang Cheng, and the juniors, Jin Ling, Lan Sizui, Lan Jingyi, and Ouyang Zichen. I apologize if any of those names were poorly pronounced. My brother, who speaks fluent Mandarin, tried to walk me through these as best he could, but I'm a little bit stupid, so I apologize in advance. The show starts in the middle of a flashback, looming over a massive battle where there are no allies or enemies. Everyone wants this, the fabled Stygian tiger, totally not a chameleon, amulet. It's a slaughter, and all these men straight up killing their own allies are all gonna come back later and still be in charge of their clans like nothing happened. I usually hate when shows or games start in media res because it usually starts with a dramatic pause and a, yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here, and it's like, no, we aren't. Shut up. Move on. However, I believe that The Untamed did it really well, because it establishes the rampant greed and resulting hopelessness by Wei Wuxian, flinging himself off a cliff, and out of everyone fighting over power, there are only two people who don't give a damn. Long Wenji, who wants to save him, and Jiang Cheng, who wants to kill him. Wei Wuxian dies anyway, and you find out the story is being told to a bunch of well-dressed teenagers who say that Wei Wuxian was a glorious war hero, who eventually lost his mind and died falling off a cliff, though no body was ever found. Because of that, he can never be resurrected. One of the well-dressed teenagers, Lan Jingyi, asks, Okay, if there was no body found, are you sure he died? Because if you think about it, for the last 16 years, there are two sect leaders who have been relentlessly searching for any sign of him, and one of them just happens to be a beloved teacher of his. So it makes sense that he would be a little bit confused. However, it seems that one of the Tea Pavilion's customers clearly wants these stories to be told in a very specific way. What the Yang Zhan Tea Pavilion owner is doing is pretty risky. If you look at the wide shot, you see someone from the Jin sect here. And I'm not saying that it's Jin Ling, but it might as well be. And you know, Jin Ling is the nephew of Zheng Cheng, the man who kills anyone who glorifies the Yiling Patriarch. Yeah, that Jin Ling. So either the man behind the curtain is much scarier than Zheng Cheng, which is <laughs> unlikely, let's be real, or paying him an exorbitant amount of money. He wants everyone listening to know that Wei Wuxian had a great deal of power. So who's to say that he'll never come back even after so long? Uh, so naturally, the next scene is Wei Wuxian being resurrected. We're taken to the Mo Mansion, where Mistress Mo's severely ill nephew, Mo Zhuan Yu, has done something pretty horrible to himself. However, this is the first and last time we see the man himself. But in this moment, we only know three things about him. He's in poor mental and physical condition. He didn't want to give away his body, 
but he's too angry to care. So brief aside, if you're a fan of the book, just know that this show tends to paint everyone who's not an antagonist as an innocent victim. Just like that, Wei Wu Shen comes back to life after 16 years, and he's promptly beaten up and yelled at. He's a little too confused to fight back right now, but Mo Zhen Yu usually lives in squalor, so no one seems bothered that his room is covered in blood. Turns out that Mo Zhen Yu was the son of a very prestigious cultivator, and Madame Mo is his aunt. So that means he had the ability to do this very intense, incredibly dangerous ritual. Considering that he died reviled, hated, and so despair ridden that he threw himself off a cliff, Wei Wuxian isn't super thrilled about being alive or about being cursed. The curse mark has four cuts, all of which will never heal as long as the people Mo Zhen Yu hates remain alive. So Wei Wuxian isn't really alive or dead. Think Pirates of the Caribbean without skeleton skin or vulnerability to Donald Duck's magic. Wei Wuxian immediately sets about getting some recon as to who Mo Zhen Yu is other than really angry and wants revenge. I love this scene because we see instantly how intelligent Wei Wuxian really is. He's been alive for all of 10 minutes, and he still has the presence of mind to glean information about who he is and what he should be doing. He learns that Mo Zhuan Yu went to Carp Tower when he was about 13 meaning Mo Zhuan Yu was taken to Carp Tower by Jing Guanshan before he died. So that means he's probably in his late 20s, 30 at the most, whereas Wei Wuxian mentally is pushing about 40. Not long after, Wei Wuxian runs into the well-dressed teenagers from before. They're cultivators too, and he has to be very careful because even though he doesn't recognize them, they could still recognize him. Luckily, Mo Zhuan Yu owns a mask. What a coincidence. It's almost like someone planned it. Back with the well-dressed teenagers, these kids are clearly prestigious enough to be treated to yet another meal. I'm just going to assume that having a refined golden core gives you a big appetite a la D. Gray Man, because the amount of food these people eat on a constant basis, like every other scene, somebody's eating something. Wei Wu Xian decides to do some more recon through some uh, antics and figures out what's going on. And he finds out two things. One, Madame Mo's son is a bit of a kleptomaniac, but he still doesn't really know exactly what Madame Mo's son stole from Mo Xuan Yu. And then there's an evil spirit somewhere in this manor. Side note, Madame Mo is either really intent on currying favor with these kids, or they, she is just super chill about there being a whole ass evil spirit in her house. And I don't want to harp on her for long because she's really not that important, but I just want to call out to the set and character work here. Her table is bigger than her husband's and she doesn't even need to say anything when he talks out of turn. She just glares at him. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how you establish a toxic family dynamic in five seconds. Wei Wuxian also starts to build a rapport with this kid, Lan Sizui, who may or may not find his accents more nostalgic than annoying. Lan Sizui warns Madame Mo to stay inside tonight and let them work undisturbed. Her son is less than agreeable. Okay, yeah, quick question. Why is this dude dressed like a whole ass carpet? Outside, Wei Wuxian is conflicted about his current predicament. He has four scars and the Mo clan has three members. He might need to kill the entire Mo clan, which isn't ideal, even though they're pretty awful. He sees the well-dressed teenagers again and he finds out that even though most of the cultivation sex want wanted him dead, they still use his tricks. He grabs one to get a closer look and ends up talking to Lan Sisui again. You ever see something that immediately reminds you of your ex and it just ruins your whole day? Well, that's exactly what happens to Wei Wuxian, and he's quiet for the rest of the day, and he spends the night playing their song on a mm, blade of grass. Uh, you know what? Just go with it. If Link can do it, so can Wei Wuxian. Lan Sisui recognizes it as something they hear often at home, but it's being played so badly, either his brother doesn't recognize it or doesn't particularly care. And it's probably the latter because technically they're working right now and this is no time to be distracted. Like, Lanzui, what are you doing? Sometime during this, however, Madame Mo's son steals a flag that's meant to summon demons. So surprise, he gets possessed by a demon. Naturally, his parents blame the black sheep who knows a lot about demons. Madame Mo specifically references when Wei Wuxian threatened to break her son's arm because his arm is super broken and mutated. Look at Wei Wuxian face. He's experiencing like the worst deja vu ever. Lan Sizui tries to mitigate the situation, but the son ends up dying. So this is a little confusing because I can't tell if he thinks the guy is unconscious or if he's just straight up lying to keep Madame Karen calm. She has the audacity to call the kid down to the dirt and Wei Wuxian leaps to his defense. The man is a lot of things, but he is not someone who tolerates elitist bullshit. Her acetry gets her and her husband possessed and the kids start doubting that they can handle this by themselves. 
themselves. They decide that it's time to call dad. Wei Wuxian knows who their dad is, and he is not trying to get resurrected and dead in the same day. And listen, it's not that he doesn't want to see him again, but if the world knows he's alive again, everyone is coming after him. Instead of just leaving and waiting for everything to blow over, he tries to finish his debacle as soon and discreetly as possible. While he's able to deduce that the demon is hiding in people's left arms, he and the kids aren't exactly quick in subduing him. Even though it's safe to say that the kids would probably assume that the corpses are alive because of the demon, his powers of necromancy are pretty damn distinctive, so Wei Wuxian is taking a huge risk here, especially knowing that Long Wanji, the man who knows him better than almost anyone else, is on his way. And a brief note about the fight scenes in this show, particularly group fight scenes, they can be a little bit interesting. The extras definitely make some choices or are just flat out on some other shit. Regardless, this is our first glimpse of Long Wanji. Look at this man, this walking bloom filter. Tolkien elves wish they had this style, this grace. Legolas Greenleaf who? I mean, the man descends from the heavens on a regular basis. Waist, snatch, edges, laid. The man is flawless. He is the goat and further cements his goat status by subduing the demon easily. And he does end up saying, well, no, this one's pretty powerful. This one might've been out of your league, kid. Sorry about that. And he surmises that the powers of the Stygian Tiger Amulet, sorry, Stygian Tiger Amulet, I still don't, Stygian, Stygian Tiger Amulet. You know what? Because it has several adaptations and several pronunciations, I am most likely going to start calling this the Yin Tiger Tally as it is much easier to pronounce. And the Yin Tiger Tally was supposedly destroyed alongside Wei Wuxian. Wei Wuxian still needs to keep a low profile though, and he gets the hell out of Dodge. Long Wanji is left wondering if Wei Wuxian is really alive after all this time. The next morning, a man with a very distinctive fan comes to Yong Zhan Ti Pavilion again, but he's done with the owner's services. It turns out he was paying him a lot to tell the stories, specifically of Wei Wuxian, for three days straight. It's almost like he was preparing for him to come back to life. As the owner of the Yong Zhan Pavilion cries out about how rich he is, and he better use that money to get the hell out of town because the feudal lord is dead and it's anybody's game, Wei Wuxian takes the Mo fan family's donkey out of town. He needs to find the last person he needs to take revenge on, and there's no telling who it could be. Since Mo Zhen Yu was ejected from Carp Tower, it's probably a cultivator, which is a problem considering that Wei Wuxian is the world's most wanted cultivator. But you have to have a refined golden core to get friendly with one, and you need to be pretty important. No one really likes Mo Zhen Yu, and it's not like he's just gonna find cultivators chilling out in the woods. Wei Wuxian takes his donkey down Dauphin Mountain, intent on finding the last person Mo Zhen Yu wants to kill. God, I love this show, but it does have a lot of faults. The fake side saddle leg is definitely one of them. Still, he scarcely gets a few miles out of town when he runs into yet more cultivators. Also, brief aside, does being the Yiling Patriarch means you can't drink anything normally? Like, damn, I mean, you don't need to do that, sir. Sir, sir, this is a Wendy's? In canon, it's actually pretty weird for cultivators to just stroll around like this because they use their swords to fly. However, looking at all these cliffs and trees, it's really not all that surprising. I mean, you get a little distracted and next thing you know, you're a bloody splat on the side of a cliff. So he tries to probe them for some information, but they end up arguing over this compass instead. And apparently, Wei Wuxian made it back in the day, and we learn that effusive praise makes Wei Wuxian just as uncomfortable as effusive rebuke. He meets a woman named Yen, who feeds his donkey an apple and is clearly in a poor mental state to her mother's great distress. It turns out Yan, her husband, and her fathers are all victims of soul stealing, but Yan managed to survive because her father made a wish for her soul to come back. However, her soul has been scrambled, and she often spends her time deliriously dancing towards Dauphin Mountain until she collapses. Can we just take a minute to appreciate this scene? Everything about it is beautiful. The scenery, the dancer, the aesthetic, everything. Also, I choose to believe that after everything is said and done in this show, that one day Yan wakes up and is just back to normal and that her, her and her mom can live happily after everything that happened to them. I know that's probably not happened, but I choose to believe it. So they hear some cries for help down the mountain and Wei Wuxian goes down to check it out, but it turns out it's just the cultivators from before and they're stuck in some very expensive demon trapping nets. But 
but Yan and Wei Wuxian aren't the only two driven to the mountain. It's here we meet Jin Ling, who's here to look cool and slay demons, and he certainly looks like a damn fool, so one of those options is out. It turns out that Jin Ling and Mo Zhuan Yu actually know each other. They're technically cousins, and he quickly taps out Wei Wuxian's tolerance for elitist bullshit, and he says... Well, you clearly lack maternal education, without knowing that Jin Ling is his dead sister's only child. And he finds out in the worst way possible, by running into the man who killed him. Jung Chung is, in sense, a badass. In his late 30s at this point, he literally built the Jiang sect from the ground up and maintained it even after its downfall. So let's put this into perspective. At this moment, no one in the cultivation world has accomplished as much as Jung Chung at this point in the story. He's Wei Wuxian's younger brother and Jin Ling's uncle. Wei Wuxian only had one other sibling, a sister he loved very, very much. A sister he just accidentally insulted. And okay, I'm going to pause and acknowledge this now. I know Jung Chung is much worse in the book, but as stated before, we aren't talking about the book. I fully intend to give this version of the character credit where it's due. Jiang Cheng and Jin Ling represent the consequences of Wei Wuxian's actions. Both of them are arrogant, jaded, and paranoid, kind of like the Yiling Patriarch himself before he died. Zheng Cheng instantly recognizes the Paper Man spell on Jin Ling's back as one of Wei Wuxian's tricks. To him, any of those spells are punishable by death, and Jin Ling is 100% down to murder. Yeah, A-plus parenting there, champ. You learned that from your mom? It's a good thing that there are even more cultivators in the area to mediate like Hong Wan Jun, who is always so calm and serene. Wei Wuxian is understandably terrified, seeing everyone he knows in one place. It's almost like someone planned it. Zheng Cheng and Long Wanji haven't spoken since the slaughter at the Nightless City, so it's been about 16 years. So someone from Tumblr uh, actually brought this up, and if uh, if you see the link down below, you'll see her uh, Tumblr. Uh, it's a uh, Canary or Miss uh, Mary Dell. Um she's in the links below, but she actually observed that Jung Chung is the more level-headed person in this situation. He actually goes out of his way to be pleasant, albeit in the most passive-aggressive way possible, and he expects Lan Wen Ji to do battle, but my dude is just not having it. He doesn't even say a word, and it's so petty, too. He actually gets Lan Sizui to explain the rules of night hunting. Jin Ling's attitude goes from bad to worse, which is normal. Lan Wen Ji responds by bullying him with a silence spell, which apparently he he's pretty fond of and is a Lan clan staple. Before the fight can escalate, however, Jiang Cheng is told that all of the super expensive nets they bought have been destroyed by a glowing sword. The Lan sect offers to replace them, but Jiang Cheng is pretty much done with this conversation and with this whole night hunt in general. Look at this man's face. It just screams beleaguered manager on Black Friday. Wei Wuxian finds out two things from that interaction. One, Long Wanji has been looking for him for the last 16 years. Two, so has Jung Chung, both for vastly different reasons. Back at the shore, and without his donkey, Wei Wuxian needs to process what just happened. His nephew is still alive, his brother still hates him, Long Wanji still loves him, and he's in deep shit if he can't get out of this forest without any of them seeing him. He feels especially bad for teasing Jin Ling about his dead mother, and indirectly insulting his own sister, the only person he loves more than Long Wanji. This brings back a lot of memories, particularly of his brother and sister declaring that they should have always always been together and should have never been separated. As lovable as Wei Wuxian is, he did break all of his promises to his family. Whether or not you think it was for a good reason is up to the viewer. But one thing is for certain, he really misses them. He gets a little too involved in his flashbacks, and he overhears that no one really has faith in Jin Ling, mostly because of all the coddling he's received from his uncles. Wei Wuxian promptly slaps himself across the face. Try as he might to be indifferent, he is now Mo Zhuan Yu, and he has to accept the hand he's been dealt. Meanwhile, with the well-dressed youth group, they find some very old graves and an even older gravekeeper. They question him, but their impatience causes them to miss a vital piece of information. The statue in Tianyu Temple can move. Wei Wuxian ends up going to the same grave after encountering some soul-gathering grass, which apparently happens when a cultivator dies, it's all very circle of life, and is literally never brought up again. The old man doesn't have to tell him about the statue, though, because he remembers an old friend who told him 
that her family members are buried here. He remembers that the Temple of Dauphin Mountain has a cursed, soul-stealing statue that can turn people into corpse puppets thanks to the piece of yin iron in it. He and Long Wanji were barely able to subdue the thing back in the day, much less kill it, so he has to stop the kids before they get there. Otherwise, they're in a lot of danger. So naturally, they're already there, and Jin Ling is blaspheming all over the place. <laughs> Meanwhile, Zhang Cheng and Long Wanji are having the world's most awkward coffee break. The statue takes Jin Ling's criticism super well. Luckily, Wei Wuxian gets there just in time to get them out. When they get somewhere safe, the Wonder Twins realize they've used all their signals to call for help. This is where we learn that Long Wanji, as venerated as he is, has faults as a teacher, because the kids lack practical knowledge and tend to forget important things, which is exactly how he was when he was younger. And that's why he needed something like Wei Wuxian around. These kids need him too. Lan Sizui might be the smart one, but Lan Jing Yi is the most perceptive, because he is the first one to call out Wei Wuxian for not being as loopy as he led them to believe. Jin Ling isn't here for the conversation though, he has other ideas. And okay, real talk, where did he even come from? The statue and all his Jin sect cultivators are running down the path and he comes from the opposite way on the top of a cliff? When did he get on top of the cliff? I, okay, so he could have flown on his sword, sure, but they were in a cave. How could he have gotten, you know what, moving on. Unlike the Wonder Twins who forgot to bring their signals, he just refuses to call for help at all, and he nearly gets rocked. Without a sword or effective talismans, Wei Wuxian takes drastic measures. One of the most distinctive things about the Yiling Patriarch was his flute. He used it for everything, even fighting with it like a sword. He could control spirits of the dead with his music. Instead of literally anything else, he could have summoned anything. He was planning on summoning literally anyone else. He wanted to summon literally anything else. He thought he was summoning literally anything else. Instead, he ends up summoning his infamous ghost general, Wen Ning, who is not only supposed to be dead, but pulverized. This makes things especially difficult because Wei Wuxian is trying to keep a low profile and summoning your best friend and signature weapon isn't exactly subtle. Not only is Wen Ning clearly not himself, he's very, very dangerous and demolishes the fairy statue in one one hit, which isn't supposed to happen. Wei Wuxian starts to realize that he's been set up. Everyone tries to surround Wen Ning and tries to fight him instead of the guy who summoned him for some reason in hell. Jin Ling's wondering that too. So Wei Wuxian has three objectives protect his ghost general, protect all the kids, and keep himself from being discovered. And he gets about two out of three. Having followed the sound of a song he composed and shared with only one other person, Long Wanji finds Wei Wuxian and a whole ass ghost general. Like imagine how he feels in this moment. It's been 16 years, okay? And for maybe about 12 hours, he's been like, man, could Wei Wuxian really be alive after all this time? And now he, is. And you know, I, I know I've said several times, at least on social media, that Wang Yibo is not my first choice for Long Wanji, uh, at least in physicality, because I always pictured uh, Long Wanji being more muscular than slim and with a deeper voice, probably taller than Wei Wuxian, but Yibo Wang does the most. He goes from, I know it's you dumbass, to holy shit, it really is you, with barely changing his face and it's beautiful. I'm not sure if you know this, but my biases are definitely showing. Put into perspective, Long Wanji has waited 16 years for this moment. However, Zheng Cheng has spent just as long dreading it. Long Wanji gives Wei Wuxian a chance to run, but Zheng Cheng is faster. Zheng Cheng has a very special weapon called the Zidian, which is a very special whip. It can eject spirits possessing bodies and can generally just fuck up a regular body worse than a regular whip. The whip of punishment has left the chat. However, Wei Wuxian isn't possessing Mo Zhen Yu. He's been summoned. That body is his now. So as it stands, there is no way Zheng Cheng looks good coming out of this. Long Jing Yi even calls him out because to everyone else here, Zheng Cheng is straight up just whipping a dude who frankly at this point has already been through enough. For a brief moment, you can tell that even after all this time, Zheng Cheng is more hurt than angry. Wei Wuxian, however, has overexerted himself and promptly faints. 
get used to that. And he wishes that he could go back to his youth 16 years ago. And just like that, he does. Uh, but only in flashback form, of course. The show perhaps puts too much emphasis on the flashback, and it lasts a hot-ass 30 episodes, so, uh, strap in. 16 years before, we see a younger, happier, and just generally more naive Wei Wuxian wake up in the idyllic town of Kaiyi. He and his adopted siblings are about to go to summer school in Gusu with the lawn set. While Jung Chung is concerned about the lecture, Wei Wuxian is more concerned about goofing off, with this being their first big trip away from home without their parents. Zhang Yanli is just happy to see her brothers get along and to be away from home, and honestly, because, uh, yeah. However, she clearly favors one brother over the other, letting Wei Wuxian lead her away while Zheng Chang is talking. Ugh, I know that feel. While Zheng Chang talks logistics, Wei Wuxian talks vices. He wants to try Kai Town's famous Emperor's Smile liquor, and quickly grows tired of Zheng Chang's nagging. And Zheng Chang's concerns are all legitimate. Wei Wuxian is still a part of the Jiang sect, and any shenanigans will reflect on them, particularly him, because even though he's the youngest, he's the one that's supposed to be in charge. When you think about it, Zheng Cheng is right, because Wei Wuxian gets in trouble at the cloud recesses almost every day. Zheng Yangli, however, does precisely nothing about that. Wei Wuxian is a free spirit and should be free to act however he pleases, whenever he pleases, because that is totally not going to bite him in the ass one day. Not. At. All. One of the first things I read about The Untamed is that the first two episodes are the worst ones. And honestly, that's a hot-ass lie. They might not be the most interesting, granted, but I think they do a fantastic job of setting up the plot. I've actually seen the first two episodes so many times. I tried watching the show about twice before I settled down to actually watch it. The first time, I only watched the series because Netflix recommended it. I misunderstood the plot and I had no idea about the source material. I figured there was going to be sort of a Sora re Kairi love triangle with a set of adopted siblings, and I instantly lost interest because, uh, no. The second time, I was made aware of the source material, and I ended up rewatching Haikyuu instead because, like, I mean, why not? You always need a Haikyuu rewatch at, like, all times. And Haikyuu will also be getting its own analysis series, uh, once it finishes or if I have time for it, you know, which everyone comes first. I prefer video games and books over TV shows. I usually don't watch new shows unless I'm desperate for something entertaining, and being stuck in my apartment for the better part of a year, and possibly several months after, is not great for the mental health. So, I settled down to watch it, and I don't regret it, clearly. I'm an avid watcher of foreign dramas, and this is definitely one of the better ones I've watched. Honestly, I'd say it's in my top five. If you're interested in any kind of content creation, you've probably heard of the phrase show, don't tell. And honestly, it's one of the most annoying phrases in writing because, uh, well, it's right. In order to care about something, you have to see it happening. If someone tells you, but you have no proof of it, it's difficult to get invested in it. That's why a lot of philosophical institutions require faith. But when it comes to fiction, particularly genre fiction, you can't just take things on faith. The show really struggles with the whole concept of show don't tell because of production costs and time restraints and they do the best with what they have sometimes. The showing is vitally important to the non-linear narrative because consequence comes before action. Otherwise, what's the point? Persona 5 is a great representation of this because it's the exact same story structure. Just like The Untamed, it starts off in the exact way with a few caveats. It starts in media res with a casino heist, technically a flashback, and it ends in disaster. Then we have the interrogation, the consequence. Then Joker tells Psy everything. This is the action. While the interrogation is a consequence, telling Psy everything is a choice Joker made, just as Wei Wuxian made the choice to blow his cover and protect Jin Ling. Large chunks of Persona 5 and The Untamed are told by unreliable narrators, essentially talking about their own death. The twist is not in how they fell from grace, but how they survived. Not in who betrayed them, but who was really pulling the strings all along. However, in the case of The Untamed, Wei Wuxian is just lucky the mastermind is on his side. Next time you see this fan, you'll have forgotten about it.
Non-linear storytelling relies on show, don't tell. I would say more than any other storytelling structure. The more character-driven your story is, the more important their choices are. And trust me, no decision goes unpunished in this show. Let's take Wei Wuxian and Long Wanji's character introductions, for example. Wei Wuxian's introduction starts off with us being told that he was a great war hero who lost his mind and rebelled against the gentry. He was clearly in his right mind when he threw himself off a cliff, if beside himself in grief. Very different from the book, by the way. The next time we see him, he's just as they said, hyper competent despite his penchant for chaos. So the stories about him are true, but only to an extent, because he also displays a great deal of empathy, not just with Mo Zhen Yu, but defending Lan Sizui from Madame Karen and speaking to Yan's mother as an equal. A sharp contrast to every other cultivator who's either come off as an arrogant prick, arguing amongst themselves or complaining, with the exception of a few, including Lan Sizui and Jing Yi, but they clearly stand out as exemplary in their field. You'll go on to find that Wei Wuxian's empathy is his best and worst quality. It's also incredibly dangerous. Then we meet Long Wanji, and the buildup is pretty much the same. He is one of the only people who tried to save Wei Wuxian before he died. 16 years later, we find that he's not only distinguished, but respected, and his students know him well enough to speak on his behalf without complaint, which is also different from the book, but whatever, we're not talking about that. So right off the bat, he's clearly Wei Wuxian's narrative foil, and honestly, he's a damn good one. I'll talk more about this later in a video that's specifically about their relationship, but the dark light relationship trope exists for a reason, because it's wonderful. Wei Wuxian is empathy, Long Wanji is sympathy, Wei Wuxian is practicality, Long Wanji is intellect, chaos, order, I could go on. I love couples like this, but it's a slippery slope in TV shows because it's easy to tumble into toxic relationship dynamics, especially in Western shows because they go on for like five, six, seven seasons, in some cases even 15 to 20. It's just nice to see a couple that thinks of each other as equals and their relationship serves a purpose beyond endgame romance. Speaking of toxic relationship dynamics, for some reason this is considered a hot take, but Jung Chung is an antagonist. In a world of morally gray anti-heroes, a lawful good hero with a temper is an antagonist. He is against everything Wei Wuxian and Long Wanji stand for. He is the perfect example of someone who will choose loyalty over his ideals. In any other story, he'd be the protagonist, and the show knows it. I mean, look at his entrance here. Slow motion, his own motif, and a bitch in Hanfu. Even Wei Wuzhan is like, oh shit, why do I hear boss music? Moreover, Long Wanji and Jiang Chung are represented in the children they've raised. Like his mother before him, Jiang Chung raised Jin Ling for his ability, not for his well-being. So he ended up passing on his worst qualities making him a spoiled, whiny, arrogant brat. Lang Wanji, on the other hand, raised Lan Sizui, who's a bit of a space cadet, but he's sweet and understanding and good at what he does. This will become more important after the flashback. Speaking of said 30 episode flashback, one of the best things about transitioning 16 years into the past is that we're not subjected to god awful voiceover narration. In the span of three minutes I counted, we're shown not told that that Jiang Chang and Wei Wuxian were once close despite their differences, and Wei Wuxian wasn't always a terrifying sorcerer, and it gets your attention and gives you a sense of dread, because you're left wondering, how does this become this? How does this become this? It's all because of the choices they made, and the consequences of these choices reverberate far and wide, 16 years wide to be exact. Wei Wuxian has a pretty tough resurrection, because he's confronted with almost all of the consequences of his past actions in 48 hours. It's almost like someone planned it. I originally wanted to start with the slaughter at Nightless City, but it'll be more important later on. So instead, let's start with Jin Ling. At this stage of the game, we can only assume that his mother's death is Wei Wuxian's fault. And I'll let you guys decide on whether or not it is because I know where I stand on that. Jin Ling is pretty much alone in the world, save for his uncles. One of which, you know, kind of gives him a Capri Sun and puts him in front of the TV and mostly ignores him. And and the other one is a rage monster. This might be editorializing a bit on my part, but Jin Ling reminds me of that kid who got a smartphone at age eight, but was always forgotten by his parents after extracurriculars. He was tolerated more than he was raised. And honestly, he's going to pay for a tragedy he had nothing to do with for his entire life, thanks to Jin Cheng and Jin Guang Yao's unyielding bitterness. Honestly, I feel the same way these cultivators feel. 
Jin Li might be a whiny piss baby with no friends, but you can't help but feel bad for him. The kid's been raised by vipers. I'm probably going to devote an entire video to him and his friends later down the line, but I just need you to know that the juniors are my children, and I love them. The ramifications of Wei Wuxian's death aren't readily apparent in Long Wanji because the reveal is so much more satisfying and heartbreaking that way. So the next person is Jiang Cheng, who has always been an anxiety-ridden hard ass, but now he's a shadow of his former self, a bitter, hardened war hero who, sort of, killed his own brother to preserve the order. Actually, I prefer this interpretation of him to his fuck y'all, I got minds attitude in the book because I think it suits the show a lot better. The show really needs someone who represents the moral dilemma without the help of the narration. Jung Chung is one of those characters who fits perfectly into that role because they really emphasize his struggle between his loyalty and his ideals. He does eventually choose loyalty and it sucks for everyone. And honestly, the fact that he clearly still regrets it already puts him above his book portrayal in my mind. Because in the book, he came off as ignorant, hateful, and honestly, a little stupid. Lastly, we have Wen Ning, or Wen Ning. Sorry, I'm still trying to get good at pronouncing that. Get good, loser. Brief aside here, I know that the name is supposed to be derisive, but the Ghost General is a badass name. Being a ghost is one thing, all right? But being a leader of a whole ass army of ghosts, hell yeah. Like his boss, Wen Ying, is baby, but perhaps even more like his boss, he's killed a lot of people. Some of them were really important, and people are terrified of him. In every adaptation, he gets the short end of the stick. Whatever grace and forgiveness Wei Wuxian receives through the story, Wen Young receives about a fraction of it. I actually really like that they don't harp on his agency too much like they do with robots and literally any other piece of media. Like, okay, we get it, Blade Runner was a good movie. So that gives us three characters directly affected by the protagonist's choices. Jin Ling, whose parents were killed by Wei Wuxian, debatable. Jiang Cheng, who killed Wei Wuxian, also debatable. And Wen Ying, who was created by Wei Wuxian. In turn, their choices affect him. If Jin Ling never dove off the cliff from God knows where, Wei Wuxian probably wouldn't have blown his cover. Despite the fantastical setting, the choices made in this show are surprisingly grounded and realistic, which means a lot of them are not great. Looking at you, Jiang Yanli, one of the worst mistakes you can make as a writer is assuming your characters will always make good decisions, especially if they're driven by their emotions, which almost everyone in The Untamed is, particularly our main character, Wei Wuxian, as his ideals will eventually make him into the Yiling Patriarch. Time is a valuable thing, and I rarely watch anything without being positive that I want to spend time on it. The Untamed turned out to be much more than I expected. We'll go through the series talking about pivotal aspects of the show and all of the terrible decisions. As for my socials, I'm on Tumblr, Instagram, and TikTok because fuck Twitter. I stream occasionally too, mostly chill Sims content and uh, mostly The Sims 3 because fuck The Sims 4. Like this video if you liked this video. Subscribe if you want to see more content about writing, cooking, and media analysis. The lollipops are on your way out and I will see you in the next video.